So, uh, welcome to uh, our Nectar Education Seminar. Uh, today, we will have 75th Nectar Education Seminar in the United <coughs> University of Tokyo. Uh, today's topic is Effective Strategies for Integrating Active Learning into your Classroom or Clinic. Actually, active learning is a very hot topic, uh, and especially in the accreditation system uh, currently uh, being implemented in Japan, uh, many external evaluators pointed out our active learning is not so strong. So, uh, our university, University of Tokyo, uh, should learn from Professor Lee today. So, to you today about active learning. Uh, it's a little bit odd for me to be giving a lecture about active learning, but um, you know, I'll, I'll be asking a couple of questions as, as we go along, but uh, I hope that uh, you'll have lots of questions as we get into the uh, question and answer period of the program. So I want to start off uh, remind me that one of the critical features of education is not just uh, imparting the information that we have to someone else, but we really need to be engaging the students. Um, we need to share our passion for the subject and hopefully we'll be able to capture the, the passion of the student as well for them to be really engaged in the learning. And I think that's that's a real strong core um, to the whole idea of active learning. So as uh, Dr. Anishi mentioned, um, we're just post-accreditation here in, uh, at uh, University of Tokyo. And some of the uh, themes that came out, um, trying to link learning much more strongly with out the mission and outcomes of the university, um, promoting active learning in the context of what the overall curriculum goals are, increasing coordination among the different elements in the curriculum, and also using IT to support your goals. These were themes that I heard, um, but these are widely applicable. You know, so even in our school um, in Boston, Tufts University, these equally apply today. And so, you know, I think a really important point of accreditation is to realize that it's really about process improvement. You know, it's not just the score that you get at one particular point in time. The emphasis is really on continuous quality improvement. And so these, these four areas are, are really common to all programs. And, you know, we're at different stages of development, but we can all continue improving in all of these areas. Um, today I'm going to be focusing on active learning. Um, it's a huge topic, 
Um, I'll give you an introduction to some different approaches, um, and also uh, I'll provide you with resources that you can continue learning on your own. I wanted to start off um, with a little context. And so, um, if you can believe, this is uh, my backyard back in Boston. Um, this was a picture my husband sent me. Um, and uh, we, th this has been a historic uh, winter in Boston. I don't know if you've seen in the news. We have received over 100 inches of snow, which is very unusual for Boston, because Boston, in the, even in the winter, usually during the day it's above freezing, so that if we get snow, it, it melts very quickly. We have been in a Canadian deep freeze for a month. Nothing has melted, and even after this picture was taken, there was another two feet that got dumped on top of this, so, so over, over two and a half meters so far, and none of it has melted. So um, it's been quite crazy. And uh, I don't know if any of you recognize, this is downtown Boston, John Hancock Tower, Trinity Church. Um, it's the place of the, actually the, the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Massive amounts of snow in Boston. They actually have had trucks from different states across New England and also Canada coming down to help us actually physically remove the snow because there's just nowhere to put it. And uh, this is uh, the Sitco sign by the Fenway Park. And typically, it's illegal to dump snow into the ocean because we use salt and sand, et cetera. It's considered contaminated water. So, but they made an exception because it's, it's just absolutely crazy. And this was a picture um, from on February 10th. Um, and you can see, any of you who've been to Boston, you know the streets are very narrow. These cars are just, they're, they're in there until spring. Um, and another two feet fell on top of this um, since February 10th. They got another two feet of, another two feet of snow. And so you can imagine what the traffic is like in Boston. Nothing's moving. Actually, the trains, they had to shut down the trains for a few days, um, and it's been very spotty service. So what, is, what does all of this mean? So at our medical school, uh, Tufts University School of Medicine, we call it Tussum, uh, they had snow days. Typically, snow days are extremely rare. The hospital never closes, which it also did not. Um, but they actually had to cancel classes because most of our, well, actually just about 100% of our students commute. They do, we don't have a campus place for them to live. So they all commute in by train, bus, bike, or whatever. So um, it was so dangerous to, to move around that they had to have what we call snow days. We canceled the lectures, um, and, uh, but you know from those of you who've come previously, you know that our lectures are optional anyway. They rescheduled about 20% of them. 80% uh, were, um, uh, the faculty asked the students to review the material on Tusk, which is our electronic system. Um, so, you know, the lectures were all recorded. Uh, they could just look at them online. So, just a few of the lectures were rescheduled, but you know from my talking about our curriculum before, our emphasis on, is on small groups and the anatomy labs, which are extremely interactive. They you know, combine um, many other elements, not just dissection. So though 100% of those were rescheduled because those are considered essential in the curriculum. And the clinical sessions also, which are occurring every week, um, it wasn't quite 100%, but pretty close, um, and that was up to individual faculty out in the community. So, you know, what this, these snow days really drove home to the dean and the faculty is that they really had to think about what is critical in, in the curriculum because they lost a lot of time. Um, and the curriculum is, as you know, medical curricula are always very crowded. 
We had de decompressed a lot of our curriculum uh, in our last reform, but you know, I, I um, communicated with our dean for education. He said it's still too packed. Um, so all the rescheduling that he had to do, um, you know, just made him realize we really have to just keep working at focusing on what is most critical for our students. So when you think about learning, um, there are many different theories. You know, there's a lot of educational psychology research going into how students learn. And I, I'm, I'm just mentioning two of them, uh, which I think are the most relevant, at least you know, for the work that I've done and, and what I've seen that seems to be most helpful to our faculty. One is cognitive theory and the other is construction, constructivist. Uh, and cognitive theory, you know, basically is um, focusing on the knowing, you know, how students learn. And the, the key now in terms of how we're training our faculty is to really think about, it's, it's not about what you, the expert faculty, knows. What you need to focus on is what the student knows. Because you could be, you know, I could be talking to you up here. I have no idea whether you're listening, you know, you're on your iPad doing messaging with someone else, you're, you're checking the news or whatever. I don't know what you're thinking. You know, you're, you're sitting there listening, but I don't, I can't tell um, who's engaged and who's not. And so the emphasis is on, you know, how do we figure out what the students actually know? What are they actually learning? And the constructivist theory um, focuses on not what you do, it's what the students are able to do. And, um, and so this is where you know, we're doing a lot of the OSCEs, the simulations, standardized patients. Um, we want to see the students actually performing uh, the tasks that we think we are teaching them. So big complaint I hear from faculty is that the students are not engaged. And so I just want you to take a moment, you know, if sitting next to someone or turn around, uh, talk with a colleague, and I just want you to uh, name a couple reasons why you think your students are not engaged. Just give you a couple of minutes. Just want you to talk with a colleague. Why are students not engaged? Get to talk to someone near near nearby. If you don't know who it is, introduce yourselves. Intr introduce yourself to a colleague, and I'd like you to just come up with one or two reasons why you think students are not engaged.
Okay, does anyone want to volunteer what you came up with? What are, what are some reasons? I hear, I hear faculty complaining about it a lot. Why, 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 do you think, why do you think students are not engaged? Anyone want to volunteer? You, can, you, you don't have to say what you thought. You can say what your partner thought. was that the way the information is presented is not engaging. Mm -hmm. It's not it does not so the, the way that um, students are presented with the information is not in a in a form that they can react to or, or, mm -hmm. or feel mm -hmm. um, related to. Mm -hmm. so, so we thought that was one of the issues yeah. connected to it. Yeah. So it's not relevant, it doesn't grab their attention. Um, doesn't feel relevant? Yeah, so not relevant. Uh, other issue is, for example, uh, students don't always understand why they're being taught that. Mm -hmm. so, so they don't see mm -hmm. what the purpose of yeah. the information is. Mm -hmm. um, in, in other cases, we, we talked about how, uh, from, the, from the faculty side, sometimes we tend to teach things that we are interested in and not necessarily what the students need at, at that point in their mm -hmm. training. Right? So, so that, yeah. that could be another. Yeah. Right. So you, maybe focusing a little bit too much on our own interests rather than really focusing on what the student needs at their particular stage. Yeah. Other, other, plenty of other reasons. Who else would like to volunteer? We were, we were wondering, we had a, a class this semester where students have given us some feedback and, and a couple times they said, well, it was a little bit boring. So we, we you know, that's non-engagement. <laughs> we were trying to ask ourselves what, what caused that and, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I think they complained about the most was they didn't have an opportunity to ask questions yes. and they didn't have an opportunity to engage with the lecturer mm -hmm. who was a special guest coming. So mm -hmm. just that, have that opportunity for discussion. Yeah. Okay. Any any others? I'm sure there are more. <laughs> well, I think that um, there are many different reasons, and we can state them many different ways. But you know, I, these are common ones that I've heard from faculty. Number one is the the faculty saying the students will not pay attention if it's not going to be on the test. Um, that, that seems to be a big one. Um, not engaging, as you said, um, not meaningful, you know, what, what's the value to them? Um, you know, is it important? You know, how does it relate to what I need now or in the near future? Um, might not be feasible. We may be presenting something that's just much too complex. Um, and uh, we don't realize that um, there needs to be some building blocks to get them to a, a point where they're prepared um, for that content. And then also, uh, the last one, negative feedback. Um, it may be that uh, you know, they're, they're feeling very vulnerable, um, that uh, somehow the way the classroom is set up the environment is not welcoming them as learners, um, and they see it as a very high-risk um, endeavor. So, you know, the I think some of the points to think about, um, particularly this one that says it's not on the test. Um, I've said this before, and it's uh, if you hear me give a lot of talks. I emphasize this a lot because I feel that it's, it's, it's so true that assessment drives learning. And we've, we've already selected these students who through their entire student careers have been studying for tests. That's how they got into medical school, by passing all the tests. And so they're constantly looking for what's going to be on the test and how do I get the highest grade. So we need, if we want 
to shift their behavior, we really have to think about how we're assessing them and change the way we're assessing them to match what we're match the behaviors we're trying to um, have them learn. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, not engaging, you know, we, we talk about this being the games generation, you know, they're, they're used to pulling things off the internet, they, they look at multimedia. Um, clearly, we have shown that this group of young people really do want information in short chunks. But, you know, I can tell you, even the students 20 years ago, um, when we started using electronic media, we had already tested many students and residents, and um, we found that the maximum seat time, which means, you know, how long will they sit in front of a computer and look at something, it was 10 minutes, 10 minutes tops. And actually, that timing has held up. When you talk to education designers now, um, and if you want to create online modules, um, you know they'll say five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, absolute tops. Uh, so they need to be in short bites. For being meaningful, um, it's really critical that you link the material that you're presenting to something that they already know. And we sometimes forget, you know, we're very familiar with the material, and so we forget that many of these students are being exposed to this material for the very first time. So we need to be very explicit about how it connects to things they already know. Um, and this is where you can actually use some of the active learning to be able to draw that out from them um, and link it to things, link the new material to things they already know um, and, uh, and link it to things that they're actively doing in other parts of the curriculum. For being not important, you know, I think um, many of the things that we had incorporated into our curriculum we really had to be much more explicit about the value if it was not immediate. And, you know, one of the big motivations for our students is that they want to get into top residencies. And so when they start looking at, well, how can I get into the top residency? What are the residencies looking for? What kind of um, behaviors are they measuring me on? Um, and so, you know, we actually have been able to use um, a lot of the requirements for residency as a very strong motivator uh, for students learning um, a lot of the material in, in the medical, um, medical education four years. So, uh, and the next, you know, not being feasible. Um, this is where a lot of the cognitive theory comes in, where um, each of us, when we're learning new information, um, we create organizational structures to put the information in. And one of the um, key things for novice learners is that they may not have the organization because they don't know how the information is categorized. Um, and then when they're trying to learn new material, there's no structure to put it on. Or the structure may be incorrect. Um, and so they're building new material onto a very weak foundation. And this is where misconceptions come in. This is where misunderstanding comes in. And you, you say, well, you know, gosh, I taught that. Why, why can't they get it? And, and this is where it's really critical for us as teachers to be able to diagnose where students are going awry, you know, where they're losing their path. You know, um, and, and actually, some of these active learning techniques are really helpful to help you diagnose where the students are actually having trouble. Where have they been making false constructions? Um, things that um, really do not 
uh, match the concepts uh, that you're trying to get across. So uh, this, is, this is a really critical one. And then uh, for the negative feedback, um, I actually gave you a paper, uh, the idea paper number 41, uh, which I thought was very well written. Um, and Marilla, Sv it's hard to pronounce your name, Svinicki, uh, I, she's actually written a tremendous amount. Um, and uh, she's an educational psychologist. And uh, this paper is, I think, definitely worth reading about um, student motivation and how they learn and what are some of the stumbling blocks. And it really provides, I think, a lot of good insight when you're trying to diagnose why students do not appear motivated. And uh, I think has a lot of uh, great tips to think about um, as you're uh, trying to adjust your curriculum. And she talks about this idea about performance versus mastery, which um, a number of uh, researchers have developed over the last couple of decades. But she's refined it a little bit and and made it very understandable. And you know the basic idea is that. Um, the performance students, um, they're, they're really focused on the outcome of a skill. And they want to make sure that they, they get it right, um, whether or not, they're not as interested in the actual learning, they just want to be um, uh, seen as being competent. And so they're actually less risk takers. So, you know, if you suddenly introduce a new way of teaching, you know, you, you decide, boy, I really want to do active learning, and you start these new techniques, um, and you're wondering why students are not engaging, uh, it may be that, uh, you know, there are issues where they really don't want to take the risk of being wrong. Um, you know, versus the student who's um, really focused on mastery, they're big risk takers. You know, they want to learn anything you throw at them. They love challenges. Um, and, you know, we, we really gravitate to students who um, really thirst to, to master uh, different knowledge and skills. Um, but, you know, I think it's really critical that we recognize the students who are more in this performance-based mode um, and really start recognizing you know, what motivates them, um, what keeps them from learning in different environments. And, and so I highly recommend going through that short paper. So, uh, she also uh, talks about constructivism, and you know this is where you know I mentioned a little earlier in terms of the learner constructing their own understanding of something based on their past experience and also current interpretations of the environment, and this is where a novice can really have difficulty, you know, because it's obvious to you how things are organized and what things mean. But a student coming at material for the first time is bringing their own past learning to the table. And you know, they may be completely misinterpreting the information. And so this is where um, it's really critical for you to be able to diagnose um, how they're constructing um, the new knowledge. So I want to give an example. Um, I was asked to. Um, uh, create an imaging correlation seminar for the medical students here. And so uh, they learn anatomy. Uh, they had a little bit of radiology, but it's not learned simultaneously with the anatomy. So they learn anatomy separately and they learn some radiology separately. And what I wanted to do was to try to combine the two um, and allow them to learn the basics of um, x-ray reading, 
Uh, and also this would be a way of reinforcing their anatomy. So I, you know, I put the seminar together and um, you know, recently I also did another one with uh, chest CTs, um, CAT scans, and trying to get them to think about um, what they're seeing. So you know, here is a model and then you know, what are the shadows that they're seeing on the chest x-ray and then now when they're looking at a CAT scan, um, the CAT scan's taking slices through the body, horizontal to the ground. Um, that's what that slice is on the, on the right. And so they have to think in three dimensions. And for some students, that's easy. Other students, it's, it's quite difficult. And you know, they had not done that exercise before. Um, so I... You know, it was quite a challenge, um, and I had them work in pairs, uh, you know, so that they could help each other identify structures. Um, and then, you know, I actually had um, given them a couple of um, diagrams of CAT scans um, and asked them to identify which one actually was, which slice was higher than the other slice and I wanted them to tell me why. Um, and they had to really work pretty hard at that, you know, to think about looking at this, you know, I had them use these diagrams um, all at the same time, so they had to think about at what level could they see, you know, this portion of the aorta versus the pulmonary vessels and then be able to identify them, um, you know, on the, on the CAT scan. So it was, pretty challenging, um, but the students were able to work through it. It took some time, but um, I mean, you could see them really working at it. Uh, and that kind of engagement is, is really critical to be able to solidify their knowledge. And I had asked, um, I had done chest x-ray reading a few weeks ago, and there were a handful of students in the room who had been at the prior session. And I had asked them, uh, you know, to fill, I gave them a blank, um, you know, an unlabeled x-ray. And I had, them, uh, I had them fill it in on their own. And, you know, it didn't matter if they wanted to pull, you know, many of them pulled out their phones and started looking things up uh, on their phone to try to fill it in. Um, I didn't really care how they did it because just the process of having to label it and converse with, uh, you know, one of their fellow students to put it together. Um, they really had to actively, um, you know, think about the anatomy and think about the relationship among all of these different elements. And um, as an aside here, I, I just want to mention that, you know, I used all open resources uh, to do this. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, folks uh, really have, uh, some, some faculty have shied away from using these resources. They're, they're just fabulous. And, um, you know, I highly recommend uh, looking at the resources that are out there without needing to create your own. And so, for instance, you know, for teaching some of the anatomy, uh, here is, um, you know, this organization, which was based at a University of California school, um, created, you know, this wonderful program, and you know, really allows you to look at the anatomy um, along with the physiology. This is splitting of the second heart sound. And here, you know, you can freeze, freeze this and, and have them really learn um, the cardiac cycle. And then this, this one is uh, the diagram I focused on the most for chest x-ray reading. Um, you know, you can look at all of these labeled or unlabeled, and then also look at it um, in an x-ray x-ray version let separate left heart right heart etc i mean it's it they're just really fabulous um 
fabulous resources. And this Radiopedia, you know, another nonprofit organization, um, this is where I got a lot of this CAT scans. Um, and here, you know, I was able to show them the different levels of the CAT scan and, and talk about the anatomy at the various levels. And, you know, this resource has hundreds of cases in here. Um, and you know you you do not have you do not have to create these these are these are just on the web for you to to use um, in your own education. So you know when you think about the fact that they're learning the anatomy, they're um, trying to combine it with imaging, um, etc. The way that um, we combine this in our curriculum is we actually do all of these things simultaneously in the curriculum. So they, they do their dissection in the lab and actually at each lab table um, there is a screen. They're doing radiologic correlation at the same time that they're doing the dissection. Um, so they're seeing the CAT scans. They have bedside ultrasound, um, and so they can actually ultrasound each other, they can ultrasound um, the cadaver, they look at images on the screen, um, so they can correlate um, the actual body with the uh, two-dimensional imaging. Uh, they're getting the physiology at the same time as well as the pathology. Um, they have simulation labs. Um, they do physical exams on each other initially before they go into the actual clinic. Uh, and of course they're doing clinical cases with PBL. And what's critical is that each of these things reinforce the others. And so rather than having each individual uh, course, having these all running concurrently um, really enables the student to, to really get it. And uh, rather than just learning it for the test and forgetting it, the fact that they're using the information in so many different ways enables them to really put that into long-term memory. The biggest problem I see is that you know, we're constantly fighting too much material in too, too little time. So you know, the big thing is making each session count. Um, and that's what's really critical uh, as we're putting the curriculum together. So I know that uh, the University of Tokyo has moved to outcomes-based education, um, and they just um, uh, named some of the core outcomes uh, for the medical school. And it's really critical as faculty that we see ourselves as the filters of all of this information. I mean, there's just so much out there. And it's really critical for us to be the filters of that information to decide what we're teaching, when we teach it in the curriculum, how do we teach it, and most importantly, why. You know, why is it really critical um, that we teach that information? Um, and focusing on what students will be able to do upon graduation. And you know, for us, when we did our curriculum reform, um, we really started from graduation. We did a lot of surveys of the programs where our students are typically residents, and we asked the program directors, you know, how are our graduates doing? How do they compare to interns from other programs? You know, are they able to do what you expect? You know, so we really did a lot of surveying of our graduates first and then worked backwards in terms of the kind of preparation they needed at graduation and then what did we need to do, what did we need to change in the curriculum so that they'd actually graduate with all of the, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes expected of uh, high-functioning interns. So one important teaching method to focus on 
increasing the doing uh, in the curriculum is, is certainly active learning. Um, so I'd now like you to just think about something that you're teaching. So just pick anything. Um, you know, it could be whether clinically, if you're a clinician, um, something that you're teaching in your clinical program, if you do classroom teaching, um, you know, just pick some aspect. Um, I, I'm going to just give you a moment to think about that. some area that you think you'd like to try some active learning methods. So what we're going to be doing uh, for the next bit of time is uh, we're going to be using the sheet that looks like this. So it's a planning template. I know the print's a little bit small, um, but hopefully it's it's still large enough for you all to, to read it. Felt it was important to get it all on one page. And um, so we'll be we'll be focusing on this. Um, so the first questions to ask yourself is if you're trying to design an active learning task. Number one is, what's the purpose? Second is, what targets are you going to assess? What outcomes? Uh, <coughs> what objectives, goals, outcomes? What's the actual task that you're going to design? And then what instruction will you need? So those are all, um, these are the things in the, the dark blue boxes. Okay, so we're gonna be going over each of those. So the first, first blue box is what's the purpose? Um, and you know, the, most, uh, the three big categories here are uh, you're using an active learning task to diagnose the learning that's going on. Um, the other is that it could be for formative assessment um, or summative assessment. And is any of these, whether, whether it's diagnostic, formative, or summative, is it for you, for the student, or for both of you? You know, it could be any combination. So, you know, number one, you know, think of whatever aspect um, you picked. And if you're thinking about some active learning, is it a task where you want to use it to figure out are the students getting what I think I'm trying to teach? Um, formative, um, it could be an active learning task that will help the student self-assess whether or not they're getting it. Um, most of the active learning activities uh, typically are not um, summative, at least in the classroom. Um, but uh, certainly many of the observational um, type active learning, OSCEs, et cetera, can certainly be summative. And what's critical here is that whatever le active learning task you use, when you see mistakes, that reveals teachable moments. You know, it helps you diagnose what, where students are having difficulty. And so you could be looking for patterns across the whole class. Um, if, if you're teaching very large um, lecture classes, you know, we have 200 students per, per um, grade level. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a lot of students. And so you know, if you use an active learning technique, it can help you figure out um, are you getting across the points that you expect? Are they learning the concepts as you feel they should be learning them? And the second blue box, uh, what targets will be assessed? 
Um, this is actually one of the more complicated boxes. Um, this is where uh, you need to decide what standards are for your unit in, the, in your course, uh, what the course competencies are. Uh, hopefully your school has developed uh, curriculum benchmarks and outcomes. Uh, if you haven't, this is where you know, a lot of faculty work has to happen first. Um, you know, because if you do not have a goal um, for your unit, then it's very hard for you to design effectively. Um, most of this happens in parallel um, because you as faculty may be testing out some new methods even as your school is trying to define formal curriculum outcomes. Um, for us, it took us a full two years to design our new curriculum um, and actually another four years to actually implement. So th these are all very long-term uh, initiatives, you know, things don't happen overnight. But in those six years, there were many faculty who piloted small little projects, you know, so you can always be trying different techniques um, but at the same time, it's really critical for your school to formalize the outcomes that you want of your graduates and the outcomes for, for each year. Uh, and then uh, within that, the outcomes of each component within each year. Uh, and then you, you um, uh, get down even further down to individual um, uh, units in the curriculum, so all the way down to whether it's a lecture or a small group or a laboratory, um, you're going to need to define uh, what the standards are for each unit. And so in our curriculum, we actually have what's called a curriculum map. Um, and so in the United States, we're actually required, um, there are national outcomes uh, and competencies that are published. Um, they're quite broad, but they, they are national standards. And then each school in the United States and Canada need to show how their school competencies and outcomes map to the national standards. And then, so we have the national standards, then we have our school standards, and then for every course and every little unit, each outcome has to map up the tree. Uh, and so it becomes very clear on um, what the goal of each individual unit is. And, and I think that's really critical when you're, when you're doing curriculum design. So this, this is where a lot of work uh, has to happen. Then once you decide which standards, uh, which targets you're assessing, what level you're aiming at. You need to select, are you working in the knowledge area? Are you working in problem solving, critical thinking? Are you focusing on skills, whether they're procedural, clinical? Products of, of projects uh, that you're proposing? Or are you focusing on professional attitudes and behaviors? So, um, there's, there's a lot of work uh, in this particular box. The next one is um, deciding on the actual task. And I've separated these into what I'm calling immediate versus constructed. And this is where you can now look at the other handout with the, the blue boxes. Um, and uh, here I, I included a lot of different examples of active learning and assessment, whether they are actual methods or um, tasks. And so they, they are mixed in here. Um, and so as you decide, you know, so keep in mind what aspect uh, of your curriculum that you wanted to uh, try to do some active learning. And we're going to just quickly highlight a few things in these examples. And uh, 
for this first for this first box, you know, so what I mean by immediate is that the task, an active learning task, um, students really don't have to do any preparation or um, additional activity. They just need to quickly respond. So this is where I've included the audience response systems. Um, those of you who came to one of my early talks, um, I used the audience response system and you were able to answer on your phones um, and see your answers up on the board here, uh, up on the screen. And uh, I just want to put a footnote here. Um, the audience response systems, when they first came out, you had to purchase little clickers um, and pass them out. Do not, do not buy any clickers um, because all of the new technology now just uses the phones that all the students already have. Um, I mean, have you ever seen any student now without a phone? I, I, I don't think there, there are any students without a phone now. And so all the audience response systems now just use software that's in the cloud. So do not have your school buy any clickers. They're completely outmoded already. Um, you just, just use the, the students' phones. And uh, I think many of you have, how many of you have heard of the minute paper? And I think that one's a pretty popular one. Um, this is where at the end of a session, um, you ask the students to write um, uh, key things that they learned from the session. Um, and it's a quick way for you to see whether um, students got it uh, and really can help you diagnose where there are learning issues. Um, quizzes, uh, I just gave an example here of having a, an online pre-class quiz. Um, uh, many of our faculty like to, to use this um, to make sure that students have prepared for a lab session. So to make the most time, um, make the most of the time when they're face to face, um, the faculty wants to make sure that the students have adequately prepared before coming into that interactive session. And one way of ensuring that is you give a little quiz and you say it's worth you know, two points, which is really nothing, but the students are so trained to go after every point that they'll, they'll do the quiz. Um, to, to prepare for the lab to get those two points. Um, okay. So the, um, the next one uh, I, I listed under observation. So these are things that, again, are immediate. Um, you can watch students uh, working on simulators and, and correct um, uh, their technique. Uh, I worked with uh, San Sensei uh, working with the medical students in the simulation lab. Um, first time they were using otoscopes and ophthalmoscopes and so through direct observation I could see um, you know what their technique was and why they were having so much trouble seeing the tympanic membrane because they were aiming in the wrong direction. You know so there are things that you can do that are very immediate um, uh, observation. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, the next one, questions that you can ask, and I don't know if any of you have used this, um, the muddiest point, that just means um, for the students to um, write down what they felt was unclear or muddy. Um, and so it could be at the middle or end of the session, and again, that's very helpful for you. Great information for you to figure out whether students are, are getting it or not. Um, I'm, just, I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, then here in the um, dialogue se section, um, great way to, to get students to get used to talking with each other. Um, I share common experiences, talk about a controversy, um, have them talk about the key concepts that they discovered in the readings from the day before, explain it to each other. 
Um, and uh, this one, finding the relevance, this is interesting because you can ask the students what is relevant about a unit. And they can actually, you know, since you have a lot of students, there will be some students who will, who will identify things that make it more relevant for the other students. So they can really help you identify the relevance. Uh, this one, so this section, this bottom half, um, is what I call constructed. And this is where the students actually have to do some work uh, to put information together. And um, these can be very powerful. And uh, brainstorming answers uh, to reveal prior knowledge. So you can use this uh, as you're introducing something. Um, you can pose a question at the beginning and have them just brainstorm what they think the answers are. Uh, and you'll see how much information the students come with, what misconceptions they have um, that you need to correct before moving on. Um, you know, it can be quite, quite useful. This other one, fixing their own wrong answers and including why it was wrong. Um, you know, this, this is an interesting one um, that a couple faculty tried and worked pretty well. So you administer a test, Students got a lot of the questions wrong. Um, you actually give it back to them, have them look up the answers, and they have to write out why their answer was wrong and what the correct answer is and why that's the correct answer. Um, and that exercise actually can be extremely helpful in their learning. Um, for uh, this next one, uh, take a stand, I'll be uh, I actually have a separate slide for that one. Um, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, this is another one in terms of providing problems with incorrect answers. It's similar to this other one. Um, students identify why and offer new solutions. Um, and, and what's great about that is that the students um, really learn problem solving much more directly. Um, and so they can see that you know, um, others have produced a wrong answer. Um, it's OK to go back, rework it, rethink it, um, and, um, and develop uh, new solutions. This is one where um, reciprocal interviews of key points. Um, and so you can have the students question each other about the key points in the readings from the day before. Um, and uh, you know the other thing here, identify analogies to everyday knowledge. Uh, this is uh, something that, again, can be very helpful to you. So. Um, you may have difficulty identifying analogies that the students can relate to, but the students themselves, you know, out of the, your whole group of students, there will be some students who can actually identify analogies that are more developmentally appropriate. You know, they can, they can figure out analogies to, to their current culture that you may not be aware of. Um, so this can be extremely helpful to you um, to have the students identify analogies in the knowledge. The other thing is that when they identify the analogies, it's also a great time for you to point out what the limit of that analogy is. And so um, it may be that the analogy helps explain one, port, one key part of a principle but does not explain another section. And so um, that's a great time for you to be able to point that out. So um, I wanted a separate slide on this take a stand. Um, this was used, uh, actually, um, one of our faculty who teaches in our liberal arts part of our university 
um, is the one who introduced this. She previously had been a middle school teacher before she became a university professor. And um, this is something she used quite a bit, and we found it's terrific to use around ethical issues. And I know that for many of you, you want to um, teach more professionalism. And, uh, and it's very difficult to teach ethical concepts. Um, and this particular exercise has been really useful. And so the way it works is that you just pick a controversy, something that there's a debate about, and you get two students to volunteer opposite ends of the argument. You know, they actually don't have to believe, you know, that extreme. You just need someone to argue this end of the argument and someone else to argue that end of the argument. And those two students stand on either end of the room. And then everyone else in the room lines up between that person and that person according to the level of agreement they have with each argument. And so the students all line themselves up and obviously works better with a smaller group, not, not 200 students. And we typically will do this in our medium small groups. I mean, it, it will still work with 30 people, but um, you know, when you get up to 50, it gets difficult, but, uh, you know, smaller is better. Um, but it, it, it still will, will work with 30 people. So you then have everyone lined up, and then you ask some students that are anywhere along this line to say, you know, why are you standing there? You know, you're not standing all the way at the end. Why, why did you pick that spot? You know, what's your argument for standing there? So each student, you pick a couple students along the line, and they give their argument. And after each argument, the students get to, to move. You know, they say, wow, I really like this argument. I'm, gonna, I'm going closer here. Or, you know, I really don't believe that. I'm going, I'm going more that way. And what's great about this exercise is, first of all, it makes students think about you know, what they believe in. Um, it, they also get to practice expressing their beliefs. But what's really important about this is it shows them that there are many different views uh, in a controversial topic, and also that it's okay to change their mind based on new evidence. And, and that's a critical piece of this you know, that um, there's no single right answer. Um, so that, that's been extremely helpful uh, for us. And, you know, there, the middle section here on the sheet, um, you know, there, I think a lot of these are self-explanatory, but, you know, these are things for you to think about. Is it pre-work? Is it in class? You know, are you doing it in large, small groups as individuals? What are you reinforcing? Um, is this self-assessment, peer assessment, et cetera? Um, is it motivating, engaging, feasible, integrated? Um, and looking at the different levels of students and the different kinds of preparation that they come with, um, et cetera. Uh, this last one, asynchronous, synchronous, this is more uh, if you're using um, online tools, uh, whether you uh, want the activity to happen all at the same time, or uh, let the student uh, do the activity at whatever time is convenient for them. And then, you know, finally the last box at the bottom is what instructional planning do I need to do to prepare for this task? And, you know, People wonder why, you know, they, they put together an active learning activity and it doesn't really work. Um, and I think you can see from this planning template there are a lot of different factors that go into it um, which can affect um, the success or not. And some of the reasons for being ineffective, you know, I think a big one is that um, the expectations are unclear. 
Um, you know, the students are very used to the, as you say, being passive learners. You know, they know how to sit in a lecture. They know how to memorize and spit it back out on a test. Um, as you start using some of these new strategies, they're not sure how to behave in this new environment. And so um, I think it's really critical for you to lay out exactly what you're expecting um, with a new format. Uh, you know, why are you doing it? What's the value to them? Uh, and there's a big fear of failure. I mean, I think that um, the students, when they're in a new environment, it's a new process, um, they want to know what are the consequences. If I, if I give you an answer and it's just totally crazy, um, you know, how you as faculty react to their response is really um, very critical either in en encouraging them to talk more or discouraging them. So, uh, you know, I think that the um, potential consequences of the active learning, uh, it's really critical uh, how you respond um, to their uh, initially trying these new methods. The other thing is that um, there could be a lot of misinformation and misconceptions. Um, but I think the biggest problem is that um, there's too much material. So as you develop this active learning activity, what I find when faculty first start doing this, it's yet another thing they add on to the program. Uh, and it's just much, much too much content um, for, the, for the students to be able to work with. So I, I included this little slide um, which focuses on, helps you think about uh, prioritizing content. So um, really thinking about what do you have, what do you feel the students really need to know and understand? What should they be able to do uh, versus what should they just be familiar with? And have you think about um, these various questions about how much time are you going to allocate to each of these? But I can tell you that um, we always put too much in. And um, you know, we've now had our new curriculum. Uh, let's see, we started implementing in 2006. So we're heading for our 10th year anniversary. We're still cutting. We're st you know, it's still not enough. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's just a very difficult um, process, um, but it's absolutely necessary. So I just finished with uh, two references uh, that I can highly recommend. Um, Susan Ambrose, uh, and uh, uh, she worked with a team to create this How Learning Works. Seven Research-Based Principles of Smart Teaching, um, and also uh, this Makichi's Teaching Tips book. They're both large teaching reference books, um, and uh, they're both over 300 pages. Um, they're, they're really references. So for those of you who are responsible for um, teaching programs, I um, highly recommend this. If you're going to be very active, in helping other faculty learn how to um, start engaging students with active learning. I highly recommend having these as reference te texts in your medical education office. Um, they're very practical. Um, and uh, so, uh, um, and, and one other book uh, which um, is referenced in the other handout, 50 Cats. Um, these are classroom assessment techniques. Um, this is just a quick summary, but this book uh, by Angelo and Cross um, is another um, uh, key reference book uh, for active learning. So I think with these three textbooks, um, you would have more than enough. Um, they're very practical. They, they are all uh, research-based. Um, they touch upon um, 
a lot of the learning theories, but they're really very practical. Um, so uh, I definitely highly recommend those. And so with that, I'll open it for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>